Get your Bibles out. Come on. Come on. Get your Bibles out. Get them in your hands. If you have the ability, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's honor the Lord as we go together in prayer today. Father, we thank you we can come into the house of the Lord today. God, we can lift our hearts and our hands to you. God, we can lift our voices in song. God, we thank you for your presence already in this place, God. Thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts and our lives as we receive the word of God, which is able to save our souls, God. And it becomes a part of us and strengthens us, builds us, so that when life comes at us, God, we can handle every problem, every trial. We can weather every storm. Lord, today we'll do our part. We'll give our interest and our attention, God. You do your part. We know you will, God. You're faithful. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly today, Lord, we did not come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. God, today we've come to hear from you. Holy Spirit, you are the true teacher of the church, so welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Indian Empire as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless them as our brothers and sisters. God, bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, God, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapel, Harvest, God. We, we bless the Way and Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God, all the great churches that are out there. Too many to name by name, God. We bless the four square denomination and the assemblies of God. We bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, if they're lifting up your name, preaching your gospel, truth we bless them as you would bless us this day god also we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world lord we ask that you encourage them that you strengthen them you heal them god may they endure to the end god that you deliver them to the glory of god in jesus mighty name we're all in agreement we say amen, amen. amen. have a seat either turn in your bibles or turn on your bibles come on somebody times are changing but either way get the word of god out Go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. So you turn there. We've been in a series called Humble Faith. We've already found out throughout this series that as we come to the end of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we find that there's a list of great and mighty men that the author says he doesn't have time to talk about. We found a strand in these men's lives that each and every one of them had failures. Each and every one of them had flaws. And yet, because they humbled themselves and believed God, that God was able to use them to do great, mighty, wonderful things. And humility is simply dependence on God that I can't do this on my own. I have to have the power of God in my life. God, I need you to come through. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And as these men depended on God, that God brought about great and mighty things. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number 32. It says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Verse 33, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, Verse 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again. Now stop right there and look up at me for a second. We've seen this throughout this series already, that these guys did great and mighty things through humble faith. That the armies of the aliens came against them. And, and yet they were turned to flight. They escaped the edge of the sword. We, we see in the book of Daniel how uh, the prophets, right? Here that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into the fiery furnace. And yet they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. Daniel stopped the mouths of lions overnight by praying to God and committing his soul to the Lord. And the lions never opened their mouths against him. Uh, David and, and Samson themselves both killed lions with their bare hands because they believed God. And they went after it and did their part and humbled themselves before God. Now we come to a man by the name of Samuel. And it says not only Samuel, but all the prophets. See, Samuel was the first of many great prophets that we see throughout the word of God. And Samuel had an assignment, and Samuel encountered many sorrows in his life. There were things that took place that he didn't understand, things that took place that he didn't think were right. Like when the nation asked for a king, Samuel was grieved because he knew that they were rejecting the Lord, and yet God said, give them what they want. It's not my will, it's not my plan, and yet they're going to go through some things. Samuel warned him, the king's going to take your sons to battle. He's going to take your best fields. He's going to do all this stuff. And yet they said, we want to be like the nations around us. Give us a king. And Samuel and all the prophets we see had many things going on in their life. In fact, if you read on in verse number 35, the tone changes. See, not only did women receive their dead back through the prophets, like you remember the prophet Elijah, right? Here he is, and he meets up with this woman who compelled him to come to her house by saying, hey, I prepared him meal for you, prophet. See, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So she prepared some tasty food, said, why don't you come over to the house? You know, me and my husband will have some dinner. And so he comes over and then she builds a room on her house. And the prophet says, what can be done for her? Well, she doesn't have a son. And so he promises that 
About that time next year, she would have a son. She says, no, my Lord, don't deceive me. No, no, I, I, I'm not asking for anything. I didn't want anything. And yet, she gets pregnant and has a son. Now, years later, that son ends up dying. And she takes that son and she lays him on the prophet's bed. In other words, prophet, when you come to my house and you give me something I didn't want, and, and when that thing in my life dies, when you come back, you're going to have to deal with that. And so she goes and runs to the prophet, and there... The prophet's serving Gehazi, he's about ready to stop her, and yet she says, all is well. Everything's all good, it's fine. And so she goes up to the prophet, and she lays hold of his feet, and she says, why did you deceive me? Why did you give me a son if this was going to happen? And he says, the Lord has kept it from me. This son, something's wrong. And so he runs ahead, and he goes over there, and he finds the boy in his bed, and he raises him again to life, and he presents the son back to the woman alive. See, these were the great and mighty things that we see. And we want to overcome like the men and women of God did here in the Bible. And yet in verse number 35, all of a sudden, the tone changes. Look at what it says. It says, others were tortured. Hold on a second. You mean by faith they were tortured? No one's going to say, I believe that I received being tortured. No one's going to pray and ask God, God, I'd really like to be tortured. God, would you please send some problems into my life? And yet it says, by faith, others were tortured. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. See, all the prophets had to do was just recant their statements. They could have came to the king and said, you know what, king, uh, yeah, I prophesied that the nation was going down because you weren't serving the Lord, but you know what, I was wrong. I, I must have been mistaken. I must have misheard the Lord. Actually, you're going to be blessed. Just keep doing what you're doing. It'll be fine. They could have ate at the king's table if all they would have done was prophesied good things about the king and victories and, and, and just patty caked with everybody. They, they could have been delivered from these things in the natural by just letting up and letting go. But how many of you know when you let up on God, when you let go of God now, if they would have recanted and repented of what they had said, then they would have turned their backs on God and walked away from the promise of God. And when they died, they would not have gone to heaven. They would have ended up in hell because they turned their backs on God. But they says that they did not accept deliverance. Why? Because that they wanted to obtain a better resurrection. That's why they went through the problem is because they had a different perspective on what was important. It wasn't about the natural, the here and now. It wasn't about sitting at the king's table. It wasn't about having everyone like them. No, they would accept even torture, not accepting deliverance. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. It goes on in verse number 36, till others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, of chains and imprisonment. In fact, if you read about the, the prophet Jeremiah, you'll find that he was thrown in a cistern that he spent time in prison, that they had him in bonds. And when they were fleeing out of the country and he said, don't leave, they took him with them just to punish him. And they made him go out of the country with them. And all of them were wiped out right in front of him. In fact, uh, many scholars believe that the prophet Jeremiah, as he prophesied the word of the Lord, that tears were streaming down his face because it pained him to know what he was prophesying against the people and against the land. He said at one point that he would try not to prophesy. He's, he's just fed up. He's, he, he's done with all this torment and all this pain and, and the things that he was prophesying. And he said, I tried to shut my mouth, but it became like fire in my bones. See, we like that fire in the bones. We think that's cool. But listen, to him it was pain. To him it was sorrow. To him it was searing. And after a while it became so intense on the inside that he had to prophesy the will of the Lord to people no matter what would happen to him in the natural Verse 37, they were stoned. Now, for those of you that are new to church, that means that they threw stones at them. Come on. They were sawn in two. The prophet Isaiah has believed that the wicked king Manasseh sawed him in half. No one's believing God for that. No one's in faith for that. And yet, by faith, he went through that. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented verse 38 of whom the world was not worthy see no doubt the author is referring to things that were taking place under Nero's persecution Christians were hiding out different places and they were didn't have any clothing so they had to take sheepskins goatskins things like that in fact they were wrapped up for sport and fed to the lions and if the apostle Paul is not the author of Hebrews it's written about the same time that the apostle Paul might have been put to death. And as a Roman citizen, they would not have crucified the Apostle Paul. They took a sword, and as tradition tells us, they chopped off his head with that sword. It was a quick death. And no doubt, if the Apostle Paul is not 
the author of Hebrews, which many people believe that he is. But if it wasn't, they would have been referring to the Apostle Paul when they talked about that they were slain with the sword. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. See, we look at kings, we look at superstars, we look at basketball and football and baseball stars, and we elevate these people on these platforms, or people who make money, or people who are famous, singers and songwriters and dancers and all these types of people, and we say, oh, these people are worthy of uh, of our appreciation, they're worthy of our affection. But listen, the world was not worthy of these men and women of God who endured these persecutions and these sufferings and these trials. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Verse 39, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith. See, we would look at that and we say, that's not a good testimony. They died. They were sawn in half. That's not good. And yet, sometimes we get the wrong idea. We think that a good testimony is one that says, yeah, I used to be on drugs and I was in the gangs and I was sleeping around. I was doing all this bad stuff and then I got saved. And that's kind of the end of the testimony. Well, listen, that's just the beginning of your testimony. And yeah, it's good that God delivered you. I'm not belittling that by, by any means. But listen, there are those of us who didn't do any of that stuff. And yet, when the Bible comes along and it says they obtained a good testimony, see, it wasn't about how they got saved. It's about what they did with their salvation. Hello. They suffered. They were persecuted. They didn't let up on God and they obtained a good testimony. By faith. And they did not receive the promise. What promise is that talking about? See, all the prophets were prophesying. They were foretelling. They were foretelling the coming of the Messiah. They were looking forward to it. In fact, Jesus said that all the prophets were looking forward to it. And they were trying to find me. They would have loved to have seen what your eyes see. They were looking forward to the promise of the Messiah. And yet none of them who prophesied about Messiah got to actually see Messiah. Until after he went to the cross and then he led captivity captive. See, they were looking forward to what we are now looking back on. And they did not receive the promise that they were declaring in the natural. It goes on and it says, verse number 40, God having provided something better for us. Something better for us. Wait a second. I mean, these are the mighty men and women of God. These are the, the prophets. And yet God says that he provided something better for us through the Messiah, look at that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The Bible is very clear and it says there's coming a day when Jesus will come for his own. And when he comes, it says, don't, don't, don't misunderstand this, that the dead in Christ will rise first and you will by no means precede those who have already gone on. See, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But there's coming a day that these that are in heaven are crying out, How long, O Lord? How long? And Jesus is saying, Just a little while longer. And then when he comes for his own, the Bible says, We will not all die, but we shall all be changed. And therefore, together with the saints of God who have gone before us, and those who are still here alive on the earth, all of us together will get a new body, and we will go to be with the Lord forever and ever. Together as the body of Christ. We will be perfected. Today I want to talk to you about suffering by faith. Because we're going to encounter suffering in life. And this message is like the meat and potatoes that maybe is bland, maybe it's a little uh, dry, maybe you don't really like that kind of food, it's kind of heavy in your stomach. And yet, when it comes time to work this thing out in your life, you're going to have the strength that you need in order to make it through the problems and the trials. Some things we need to know about suffering. And the first thing we need to know is that every believer will suffer. Say, Pastor Dan, I'm not encouraged yet. (laughs) But listen, if you know this in advance and when it happens, you're not going to be scratching your head wondering why God's angry with you. Because you'll realize God's not angry with me. This is just part of life. This is part of the Christian life. This is part of the process. Is that every believer will suffer. You won't be thinking, man, did I sin? Did I mess up? What's going on? No, it's just a part of what the Christian life is all about. You're there in Hebrews. Turn back a couple of books to the book of 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, the apostle Paul is writing to his young protege. In fact, these are kind of his last words to the young pastor, Timothy. As he's writing to him, he says, Timothy, you know my life. You know my story. You know the journey that I've gone through and the trials and the pressures that have come against my life. Timothy, you understand where I've been and you see the things that have happened. But then the Apostle Paul says, those things are not unique to me. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12, he says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 
See, it's not unique to the apostles. It's not unique to the prophets. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a promise from God you don't have to claim. It's going to happen. That's a promise you don't have to confess, I believe, that I received persecution. No, you don't have to do none of that. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to worry about it. It's going to happen. If you live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. You say, but why? What did I do? Listen, it's not about what you did. If they persecuted Jesus, how much more his followers? Jesus said, no, no student is above his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so the moment you rise up and you say, you know what, I'm going to take a stand for Jesus. I'm going to give my heart and life to the Lord. I'm going to start doing something for God. You start to raise up. The devil says, oh, there's a target. Right? Starts coming against you. Persecution breaks out against you. See, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I like what William Barclay wrote. He says, it's been said that Jesus promised the disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. Come on. Come on. He said, you're going to be fearless. You don't need to fear. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, you will have joy, the joy of the Lord I give to you, not as the world gives, but I give you my joy, that you may, you, you may have overflowing and full joy. But he also said, you're always going to be in trouble, guys. Don't worry about it. Don't fear about it. It's going to happen. In fact, in John chapter number 16, verse number 33, turn there with me in your Bible. You need to get a hold of these scriptures for yourself. John chapter 16, verse number 33. Jesus is speaking. He's talking to them about what's about ready to happen. Verse number 33, he's telling them, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. See, sometimes when we approach the subject of suffering, we start to worry. We start to fear, oh, I don't want to suffer. I, I don't like the idea of suffering. You know, no one likes it. And so we start to get concerned. Maybe some of you, the moment we started talking about suffering, your palms started to sweat, right? And, and you started to break out a little bit of a rash up here. Why? Because you just don't like the idea of it. And yet Jesus says, I've told you this in advance. I'm telling you that you're going to go through some stuff in advance. Why? So that when it happens, you don't have to wonder what's going on. You don't have to be concerned. You don't have to fear or fret. But that you will be at peace. That in the midst of a storm, that you can walk out on the troubled waters of the storm. Why? Because you have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. you got the water walker living on the inside of you. And now you have the peace of Almighty God flowing through you. These things I've spoken to you, that you should have peace. And then he goes on and he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. So you are in the world, but you are not of the world. And there will be trouble, trial, tribulation in the world. But look at what he says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the book of 1 John, it says, this is that which has overcome the world, our faith. See, when you have a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter the trouble that's going on around you. Some of you guys have been so concerned about the political scene. Listen, it doesn't matter who's on the, the seat of the Oval Office in the White House. What matters is who's on the throne of heaven. He has overcome the world. And so you can smile and you can be happy. Because Jesus has overcome, and therefore you are in Christ Jesus. And when you have a humble faith that submits to whatever it is, the plan and the will of God for your life, even if it's persecution and trials and suffering, that you will overcome in those circumstances as well. See, in the midst of suffering, the eye of faith sees what's important. The eye of faith will see what is important in the midst of suffering. I've had people who have been, you know, very materialistic around me, and then all of a sudden suffering comes and they say, you know what, I don't even care about money anymore. I don't even care about that. That's not what's important. What's important is right here. People who, who have been looking for approval and acceptance of man, and all of a sudden suffering came in, and they said, I don't care who, who likes me. I don't care what's going on. That's not important. See, it's in the midst of suffering that the eye of faith all of a sudden locks into something that's greater than current circumstances. Our pains shout the voice of God in our lives. And it's in the midst of those sufferings that all of a sudden we start to see the reality of what's truly important. The things that don't matter all of a sudden are gone. Second Corinthians chapter number 4, turn there with me. If you've been going through some trials, going through some pains, if you're suffering in this place, I would encourage you to meditate on the verses in the scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Read through the whole chapter and just let the Spirit of God minister to you. Confess those things over your life. Pray those things through. 
and work those things out in your life. Second Corinthians chapter four, uh, last two verses, verse number seventeen and verse number eighteen. The apostle Paul is given a list that we're, we're we're hard pressed on every side, yet we're not broken. We're we're we're, we're bruised, you know. But we're not we're, we're crushed, but we're not completely broken, you know. And he's going through all this stuff, all the trials that have happened, and he goes in verse number seventeen, and he says this for our light affliction. I'm sorry, say what? God, maybe you don't know the pain that I'm going through. God, may, maybe you were taking a nap when they were beating me up. God, maybe you, you were going to get a snack when I lost my job. God, maybe you just don't understand what it feels like to be me, where everyone's against you and the whole world, all hell is broken loose against my life. You know, I thought it was better, but you know, after I would get saved, but the moment I got saved, all sorts of hell broke loose against my life. The proverbial stuff has hit the proverbial fan, God. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And yet, who's writing this? It's the Holy Spirit through a man by the name of the Apostle Paul, right? Paul was shipwrecked three times. Paul was three nights in the deep. Paul was beaten. He, they, they threw the stones at him too and they left him for dead. Paul was persecuted everywhere he went. Paul had all kinds of problems and trials and pressure. In fact, when, when Paul got started in the ministry, Jesus was speaking to a man by the name of Ananias. He told him, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name. And after all of that, the apostle Paul's writing and he says, it's a light affliction. How can you say it's a light affliction? I mean, this guy's went through more stuff. He had everybody turn their back on him. How can he say it's light? That hurts. It's painful. I don't like it. And yet he says, our light affliction. He goes on to say, which is but for a moment. See, we get so focused on the here and now that we don't realize the perspective of eternity. I, I, I had a pastor when I was first saved that... that Gave an illustration this way. Just for a moment, go there with me. Close your eyes, and I want you to just get a blank slate in your mind, okay? Now draw a line all the way across, okay? It goes on forever in both directions, okay? You got that? Now pick a point on that line. Any point that you pick will be the center. That right there is enough to bake my noodle. I was like, whoa, right? Okay, so, so any point you, you pick, just put, put, a little, put a little dot on that line that you, that you drew across eternity, both directions, right? You put a dot. That's the middle of that line, right? Okay, that dot is your life. Now, how much weight are you going to put in that dot versus the rest of the line? How much attention are you going to give that dot versus the rest of the line? See, you can look up at me again for, for a minute now that you've got the picture in your mind. We put so much weight on the dot. And yet there is an eternity that's ahead of us that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And we're not putting any weight over there. See, the Apostle Paul says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is a little dot. It's a vapor time, God says. Just psh, there it is, and then it's gone like that. It's a flash in the pan. It's a twinkling of an eye. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. Far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, the eye of faith sees what's truly important in eternity. So then what do we do with this? If we know this, then what do we do with this? Here's what we do. Endure suffering. Temporary pain is not worth giving up on eternal rewards. Oh, I need to say that again because some of you guys need to get a hold of this today. Endure. Stand up under it. You can make it. You can do it. I know the pains that you're going through. You shared them with me at the back door. We have prayed together. We have cried together. But listen, endure. Why? Because temporary pain is not worth giving up on eternal rewards. Don't put the weight here on the dot. Put the weight on the line for eternity. Just like Moses, you remember Moses, the Bible says that Moses forsook the riches of Egypt and the passing pleasures of sin. Why? So that he could look at the reward. He saw ahead and he saw this, this temporary stuff is not worth it. But rather the eternal reward, that's what's worth it. So also we can endure trials. When the emperor Valens threatened Eusebius with confiscation of all of his goods, torture, banishment, or even death, the courageous Christian replied, he needs not fear confiscation who has nothing to lose nor banishment to whom heaven is his country. 
nor torments when his body be, can be destroyed at one blow, nor death, which is the only way to set him at liberty from sin and sorrow. Listen, you can take my stuff, but I've got treasure in heaven. You can take my life, but I've got life eternal. And if you kill this physical, natural body, guess what? Then I'm done with sin. Hallelujah. I'm going to be with Jesus forever. Don't give up. Endure suffering because temporary pain is not worth giving up eternal rewards. How do we do it? We'll trust God's will in suffering. See, this is where faith comes in. This is where the rubber meets the road. If you're suffering, then you need to trust God to suffer according to his will. First Peter chapter 4, turn there with me. In 2 Corinthians, turn back towards the back of your Bible once again, past Hebrews. You'll find 1 Peter. In fact, all of 1 Peter talks about suffering. And specifically, chapter number 4, again, if you're going through a hard time, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. Okay, meditate on these verses. It talks a lot about suffering. Last verse in second, I'm sorry, first Peter chapter four, the very last verse is verse number 19. So if you find chapter five, back up one verse to verse number 19 of chapter number four. And look at what it says. It says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Now stop right there for a second. Think about this. He says, let those who suffer according to the will of God. So if there is a suffering that is according to the will of God, that also means there is a suffering that is not according to the will of God. Are you listening? That should be good news for all of us. Why? Because that means you don't have to endure all suffering, only the suffering that's according to the will of God. Now you say, well, how do I know the difference? Here's how. You'll find it in the Word of God, okay? Okay. There are things that we suffer unnecessarily all the time. Sometimes people say, well, I'm sick. God must be trying to teach me a lesson. And I'm suffering for the will of God. No, I'm sorry, but my Bible says by his stripes you were healed. My Bible says that a leper came to Jesus and he said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I am willing. And he reached out his hand and he did something that was unlawful. He touched a leper and he healed him. Therefore, if Jesus was willing, and Jesus is the image of the Father, then God's will is that I be healed and not be sick. Now, i got to qualify this, because if you're sick in this place, you've been sick for a long time, you've been believing God, and you have not gotten your healing yet, doesn't make you any less of a Christian. doesn't make you any less spiritual, and it doesn't make your faith any less effective. It just means that it's not the timing yet. And that God is working for a healing in your body. And you need to continue to stay in the word of God. Continue to confess the word of God. And continue to work with the will of God. Man, sometimes we can, we can help the healing process by going to the doctor. Sometimes we can help the healing process with diet and exercise. Sometimes we can help the healing process by taking our medication. See, God is not opposed to any of that. You'll find there was a part, part in the Bible where Paul told Timothy, mix in a little wine with your water. Why? Because it tastes better? No, because of your frequent ailments in your stomach. In other words, he was saying, take some Pepto, bro. <laughs> Sometimes we get so spiritual, we think, I'm not going to take any medicine, bless God. I have, I, God wants to heal me. He'll, 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 listen, take some Pepto. Come on. It's okay. Get some Tums or something like that. It'll help you out with the acid reflux. So whatever you can do to work with the will of God, but listen, if you haven't got healed yet, that doesn't mean it's God's will for you to be sick. Because I see in the Bible, it's not God's will, but rather God's will is that you be healed. Let me give you another example that's going to probably offend some people, okay? So let me qualify this one as well, all right? I need you to go there with me. I need you to hear what I'm saying. Poverty is not the will of God for your life, okay? Now, before you get offended and walk out of this place, say they're just about money, that sort of thing. Poverty is not about money. Poverty is not the amount of money in your wallet. It's not about a number in your bank account. Poverty is a state of mind and a state of being where you are ineffective without hope, and unable to progress or prosper. Now, again, prosperity, what's that? Is that money in your wallet? Is that a number in your bank account? No, it is not. Prosperity is continual growth and success in life. 
That, that's prosperity with your children, prosperity with your friends, prosperity uh, in, in your business endeavors, prosperity, yes, with your bank account, prosperity w when it comes to a witness and a testimony. See, there's, there's all kinds, you can prosper. And the Bible says, I, I, I wish that, I pray that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So it's the will of God for us to prosper and not to be impoverished. Jesus became poor that we might become rich. Now, remember, Jesus, he, he didn't have a place to lay his head. He didn't have money, all that kind of stuff. But Jesus had resources in the ministry, and Jesus was prosperous. He was not impoverished. He became poor. What does that mean? He just robed himself of the glory and, and, and came and lived here on the earth so that we might have the riches of heaven. Not talking about money. But he's talking about a state that now we could be rich. We could have the wealth of the kingdom. We could have every resource, and we could prosper in life. See, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? He, he, he wants to deplete your resources. He, he wants to do that until he can defeat you. And then finally, he wants to delete your memory from the earth, your effectiveness. That's poverty. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. See, Jesus wants you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and have every resource to do every good work on the earth. That is true prosperity. It's the will of God. Now, Listen, if you don't have a lot of stuff, you don't have a lot of money, you are no less spiritual, you're no less of a Christian, and you're no less loved by God. And you're no less loved by this church or your past. We love you so much. But listen, God wants you to prosper and not stay in poverty where you're ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is not the will of God. You do not have to suffer sickness. You do not have to suffer poverty. As you can get it in a whole little word of God, you can say, listen, I'm not going to suffer like that. I'm not going to put up with that. You don't have to. But if it's according to the will of God, you say, what is according to the will of God? Persecution. See, but we don't like that. We want everybody to like us. I've I got to build relationship with them so that they'll appreciate me and love me so that I can tell them about the word of God. No, listen, you have a responsibility to share the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and then leave the results up to God. You said if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. There's going to be times... Where people who you thought you liked and who you thought they liked you, when you open your mouth about God, all of a sudden they're going to be hating on you. That is suffering for the will of God. Over here on the front row in the blue shirt is Adam. Wave at everybody, Adam. I'm going to talk about Adam for a second. Okay, Adam was moving out here to come and be a part of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Had a call of God on his life. Wanted to be a part of something bigger than himself and have a purpose. Adam is gifted in the area of, of financial oversight. And, and he's, he's the head of our accounting department and our finance department here. And so Adam was coming out in order to, uh, you know, start doing work here at the Rock Church. And, and we get a phone call from his wife, Marvie. And she's in tears. She says, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We've had three places that we had secured when we were moving out there. And it's the craziest thing. As we started the process, they said, oh, yeah, okay, you're going to have this income. Yeah, you're going to be able to pay it, okay. And this is the location. And, yes, it's, it's available, and we're going to hold it just for you, okay. And we'll do first and last month's rent, this and that. Hey, by the way, where are you working? Oh, you're working at the church? I I'm sorry. The, the, the place actually isn't available. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your business. Goodbye. Three places, three places turned their back. I finally had to run to my house. Come on, somebody, just to get them out here. Why? See, you're going to suffer persecution. People, you, you go to the rock. That place is crazy. See, the devil didn't have any problem with ineffective Christianity, but when you're crazy for the Lord, when you start doing something for God, when you have a witness, oh, all of a sudden the devil's going to persecute you. That is suffering according to the will of God. When they're keying your car on the way into, church, way into work, when they're throwing rocks through their windows, when they're turning their backs, when they won't return your phone calls. See, we, we have an understanding of what life should be like. We want to be friends with everybody. You're not going to be friends with everybody. Just the way it is because there is a suffering according to the will of God. And God knows his plan. God knows his purpose in that suffering. Thank God we don't have to have all the answers. I don't know why bad things happen to good people all the time. I don't know why... Men of God have died in airplane crashes or why things have taken place on there. Why would you take them, God? They're before their time. What's going on with that, God? Why did they have to suffer that persecution? Dr. Baron Gilfwin's over here on the front row, one of our missionaries. He's had people in the Middle East who have died for their faith trying to get the gospel out to the nations. Why, God? What's wrong with that? Why? What's happening, God? We were finally doing a good work. Why didn't you protect them? And yet God has all the answers. And in eternity, we will find out those answers. But even if we don't, God is still just and he's still God no matter what. We don't have to have those answers. Oh, thank God. All we have to do is trust the will of God 
in our sufferings. Last thing for today is this, is rejoice in suffering. Say, Pastor, now I know you're crazy. <laughs> but when you start to encounter those persecutions, those problems, and those trials, lift up your voice and laugh a big old belly laugh. <laughs> Why? Why would I do that? Here's why. Because Jesus said so. Matthew chapter 5. Turn there with me. Okay, we're wrapping it up. Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter number 5. Jesus is speaking. He starts saying some things that nobody understands. They're wondering what's going on. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why would you be blessed? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Starts showing us what's truly important. Listen, I said I'm wrapping it up. Everybody leaves. Sit down. Church is not done yet. He goes on and he says, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted... For righteousness' sake. Now listen, if you are persecuted for your sake, you're, you're suffering the wrong way. If you're persecuted because you're being stupid, that's your fault. But if you're persecuted for righteousness, and what is righteousness? That's the right will, the right way of God, okay? That's the right thing. When you start doing things God's way, and all of a sudden somebody says, I don't like that, and they start persecuting you, you're blessed, Look at what it says. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You have a reward in eternity. Verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Pastor, why would I be blessed when somebody starts hating on me and starts lying on me? Here's why. Next verse, verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. That is that eternal perspective once again. For so they persecuted the prophets who went before see they persecuted the prophets the same way that means when you're persecuted for righteousness sake when people lie about you and hate on you and when they start beating you up and when they start messing with you and when things go bad and things go wrong because you're doing the right thing guess what you're bumping elbows with the best of them you're right there with the with the prophet jeremiah and, and on this side you got the prophet ezekiel over here and and, and, and guess what obadiah is over here and hezekiah right you got all the prophets that went before and guess who else jesus suffered and was persecuted for righteousness sake You're in good company. Acts chapter 5, we see this in the life of the disciples. Acts chapter number 5, they're going out doing the work of God, doing the right thing the right way. People are getting healed, and all of a sudden, the religious leaders just start getting angry. They grab all the disciples, throw them in jail. They start having to talk, what are we going to do with them? And they realize, you know what? If this is from God, then if we do anything against these guys, then we're fighting against God. They come to that agreement in verse number 40 and says, and they agreed... And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they beat the snot out of these guys, kicking, punching, pulling beards, throwing them to the ground. They called them out, they beat them, and it says they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Now, if that was me, and if that was you probably, we'd have been limping out of that place like I ain't never doing nothing again. Man, I did not sign up for this. This is terrible. Why, God? God, I don't know what I did wrong. Maybe I should have healed someone else today, God, because that just was not the will of God for me. Why, why would God, why would a loving God put his people through this? But look at the reaction of the disciples. Verse 41, so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. You know what that looked like? That was them walking out and they said, Peter, your nose looks funny, man. It used to be like this. Now it's like this. Ha, <laughs> ha. Hey, James, is this your tooth or is this mine? Because I'm missing like three over here. Wasn't that awesome? Ha, <laughs> ha, ow, ha, <laughs> ow. Why would they be rejoicing? That, that seems so counter of what we would think. But look at what it says. It was rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. They were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Not for their name, but for the name of Jesus. Because they weren't looking at the here and the now. They were looking to time and eternity. They were saying there's a reward. And now, guess what? We walked with Jesus. But now we get to suffer for Jesus. And we can share in his glory and eternity. This past year, we had a missions conference. And we had one of the leaders of the underground church in China named Zhang Rongliang. And in his book, I Stand With Christ, he wrote about a time where they had gathered all of the leaders together and they were going to have some ministry time. And before they even got to the ministry of the word, the police in China came in. 
They confiscated everybody's bags and their goods. They, they mistreated them and they abused them. And then they threw all the leaders in jail and in prison. And he writes these words. He says, our bodies were behind bars, confined within the four walls of a concrete cell, but our spirits were free in Christ. We could not help but sing and shout. We had all been prisoners before, so this was nothing new to us. We were in no way novices. In fact, we might have known more about prison life than some of the guards. What a joy it was to be in prison for the name of Jesus. All of us who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There's going to be things in life that happen, and we need to endure those things because we see with the eye of faith what's truly important. We see beyond the natural and the now. And we're not going to give up temporary pain for eternal reward. We won't bend. We won't bow. We're going to endure through every problem and every trial. And we're going to trust God and his will in our suffering. Not suffering outside of the will of God. No, suffering according to the will of God. So that finally we can rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that we are bumping elbows with the best of them in the word of God. Samuel and all the prophets who went through suffering and trial and scourgings and mockings and all this sufferings. Man, Great is our reward in heaven. Can you guys give the Lord a great big praise today? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. I just want to take a moment when everybody remains seated. You think that church is done. We're not done yet, guys. The only people that are getting up right now are the volunteers who have to get to their stations. If you're not a volunteer going to your station, sit down. God wants to speak to your life right now, right where you're at. I want to just take a moment. I want to talk to you about your life. Jesus says he's coming soon in the book of Revelation, chapter number one. You'll read that. He says, behold, I'm coming soon. We talked about it today that when he comes, he's coming for his own, and that we will all be made perfect together. And what if today was that day? What if it was the last day on the earth? What if Jesus came? Or what if something happened to you? You know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Oftentimes we think that because, you know, we've lived this long, that we've got an eternity on earth. Listen, you don't. All of our days are numbered. And what if today was your last day? What if it was like December 2nd last year where a couple of terrorists came into a Christmas party and took people out? What if it was like one of those accidents on the highway? What if it was they came down with something? We didn't even know it was wrong in their body. See, we're all just one breath away from eternity. And I want to talk to you about your heart and I want to talk to you about your life and I want you to just focus in and I want to give you a gift of a private moment with God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I want you to consider your life where you're at with God. What if today was your last day? Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven, or would you go to hell? Sometimes people say they don't believe in hell. We'll listen to a very real place. Jesus spoke about it all throughout the word. And that's why Jesus came and was beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross, so that you don't have to go there. And you can't avoid it by simply denying it. It's real. But heaven is also very real. And God gives us the free will choice while we're here on the earth to choose where we go, whether heaven or hell. Sometimes people think all roads lead to heaven. Listen, they don't. No one in the Bible will say all roads lead to heaven. There's one way you're going to have to get there. And Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it to the coals, made it out to be some goofy, weirdo stuff. Listen, let's not let Hollywood movies, books, television, and the internet define for us what being born again is. Being born again is not just being good. Sometimes we think we'd be good enough, God will let us into heaven. You can't do enough good because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Sometimes people think if they're raised in church and their parents told them they were a Christian growing up, or they went to religious classes, wore religious jewelry, or even that they were born in America or they're not some other religion, that that makes them a Christian. Listen, it doesn't matter how you were raised or where you were raised or what you were raised with. That's not going to get you into heaven. Sometimes people think that if they just sit in a church service, call themselves a Christian, that makes them a Christian. Well, listen, that doesn't work any more than sitting in the ocean calling yourself a fish makes you a fish. No, nope, just a dude sitting in the water. You can't just sit in church and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You, you must be born again. See, it's not any of those things. Sometimes people think born again people, well, if I just volunteer in church or maybe I can quote a scripture, know who God is, celebrate Christmas and Easter, that I get to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your volunteer service in a church or what you know about God will get you in heaven because demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is. He's not a Christian, even though he can quote scriptures. It's not about what you have in your head, but about what you've done with your heart. You must be born 
again. What is being born again? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? He's saying, lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. In a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation with those who need to give their hearts and lives to Jesus and be born again. And if you want to be included in that prayer today, I'm going to ask you to do something while everybody's remaining seated with their eyes closed. I'm going to ask you to do something by just simply raising up your hand. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, and then I'm going to clap my hands together. Bang. And when you hear the sound of my hands clapping together, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand and say, yeah, I want to be included in that prayer today. I'll see your hand go up and I'll count it. And then you can put it right back down. And today, if you've asked yourself that question, where would I go if it was my last day on the earth? If Jesus came back or if I died? And if you answered that question and said, I don't know, maybe, I hope so, or I know I'm lukewarm and I've wandered from the things of God, then today is your day of salvation and today you can come home. Today you can be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching my television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe, or even if you're listening to the sound of my voice online across the nation and around the world, God sees you right where you're at, and you can raise your hand. And you can be included in this prayer today. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. If you need to do this, get ready to get your hand up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one, two. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? On this side, there's three. Got you over there. Anybody in the family rooms? I can see you guys up there. Anybody? Three, four. Thank you. Five, six. Up on top. Got you guys over there. Seven over there. Got you. Thank you. God bless you. Eight, nine. Got you guys. God bless you. Ten up on top over here. Eleven on this side. Thank you. Thank you for the little wave up there. Eleven. Anybody else? There's twelve over here. God bless you. Who else today? There's twelve. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? There's twelve wise people already. Twelve. Thirteen up on top. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else that you didn't already raise your hand, but you know you're struggling within, maybe your heart's about ready to beat out of your chest and you're feeling like, my goodness, what's going on right now? Listen, God's tugging at your heartstrings. He's saying, you need to come. You need to do this. Thank you. Got you guys over here. Who else today? Anybody else? There's about 13 or 14 wise people. If you need to do that, I'm going to just give you one more opportunity in this moment of silence, in this moment of quiet. If you need to do it, just lift your hand up high right now. If that's you. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, we're going to pray that prayer, and I'm going to invite those of you that raised your hand. Come on, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You've got to invite Jesus in your heart. We're going to pray together. If you want to be included in that prayer, let's all stand and let's welcome them. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down right now. We're going to pray together. You come right now. Come on, let's welcome them. Let's welcome them. Let's give them a hand. Come on. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment. From the family rooms, if you raise your hand or your children raise their hand, bring them right now. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Come on, nudge your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. I'll go with you. Come on. They're still coming. Come on, from the foyer, if you're here on campus, come into the church service, or if you're in the cafe, come on, tell an usher. Hallelujah, they're still coming. They're still coming. There's room for you here at the altar. Come on down right now. Come on. Come on, they're still coming. Top to bottom, left to right. From the family rooms, come on. They're coming. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. They're coming. Anybody else? Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. You guys are welcome. Come on. 
All right, I'm going to lead you guys in that prayer just like we talked about. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Everybody bow your heads together. Everybody close your eyes. Even if you're not here at the front, but you know you need to do this, you can pray this in your seat right where you're at. Everybody say these words out loud together. Come on, put your faith in the Lord and say, Father God. Oh, come on, everybody say this together. Let's encourage them. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of all my sin, of everything I've ever done wrong. And give me a brand new start with a brand new heart. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm saved. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Woo! All right, welcome to the family of God. Right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you. This is Pastor Joel on the light-colored coat. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird goes on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? You already got past me and Pastor Jim. We're the, probably the two biggest weirdos in the place. All right, he's cool. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. So you're not wondering. You're not concerned. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading, and it's free. Okay? Just help you get your bearings and what to do next. Then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in church we call a spiritual personal trainer. You know your physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, right? Helps you to start a new lifestyle of health. Listen, we want to help you in your new lifestyle of Christianity that will build you healthy in the ways of God. So you don't go back to the old ways, but you go on with God's ways. All right? And then the third thing he's going to do, he's going to let you come right back out. All right? Your friends and family will wait for you. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. God is good. 